Unless you're interviewing for an IC3 new grad role, then you'll need to go through one or more system design rounds as part of your on-site. On the surface, these can seem a little bit more straightforward than a coding round because you don't really need to implement some crazy, obscure algorithm. But the truth of the matter is that system design rounds actually end up costing a lot of people their interview. Either they'll blow this round completely, or due to poor performance, they'll end up getting down-leveled. Now, there's many reasons why this can happen, and today I've compiled a list of the top reasons why people end up failing their system design rounds. I've read many, many candidate packets in my day, and I've noticed the same patterns appearing over and over again. I hope this video helps shine light on some of the red flags that us interviewers notice and end up rejecting candidates for. Of course, this list is not exhaustive, as there's a million reasons under the sun why you may have failed, but here are the top ones. Before we get into it, as a reminder, if you want to take your preparation to the next level and book a coding mock or a system design mock with me, I do offer these one-to-one -one coaching services. My prices are lower than any of the competition, and doing a mock with a real interview is the best way to know exactly where you stand in terms of your preparation. Send me an email or DM me in our Discord community for scheduling. Without further ado, let's get into the list. The first and most common reason that people fail is due to something called cargo culting. If you don't know what this is, let me explain with a historical example. During World War II, the Americans, while fighting in the Pacific Theater, used many small islands in the Pacific for plane refueling and cargo supply drops in order to support their military logistics. The natives of these islands, who never had before seen military planes or ships, observed that first the Americans would come, build some sort of runway or dock, and then the cargo planes and ships would arrive. These planes and ships not only carried military supplies, but also clothing, food, etc., which were then given to the natives. The natives then began to make an association. Runway equals plane equals gifts from the Americans, who they probably thought were some sort of gods. They eventually started building their own runways and docks in the hopes that this would cause the gods to then come and visit them and bring gifts. But little did they realize that the building of the runways had little to do with the movement of American supply logistics. Even after the war ended, some of these islanders still continued to build docks and runways in the hopes that the Americans would come with their gifts, not knowing that simply building a runway or a dock does not mean that a plane or a ship will appear shortly thereafter. Now, the same is true for many people who go into system design interviews. The fact of the matter is that a very large percentage of people have absolutely no idea what they're doing and really no practical real-world experience in designing systems or products. What in turn this means is that these people will religiously study resources like Grokking the System Design Interview, Alex Sue's System Design Primer, Hello Interview videos, and any of the other resources out there. But ultimately, they're just memorizing and regurgitating information that they've consumed with little to no understanding of the basic fundamentals or why particular components are used in the first place. Much like the native Pacific Islanders, they simply do things because, well, that's what I saw in the mock interview video, or that's what it said in Grokking. These people have no understanding of anything they're saying and are just reading a script, trying to follow as close as possible to their memorized solution and just repeating things with little or no conviction behind what they're saying. One follow-up question or slight shift in the problem is enough to collapse this entire house of cards and send these candidates into a panic. Because frankly, they've never learned to think for themselves, and as soon as you take away their crutch, they fall over and they have no way of getting back up again. They simply lack the knowledge to solve the problem without regurgitating someone else's ideas. They just can't function without it. This happens time and time again. It's immediately obvious who is just following a script and who actually knows what they're talking about. All it takes is a few carefully pointed questions, and these candidates are exposed. Don't get me wrong, there are many that are lucky and get through by just cargo culting, but a vast majority are found out and it ends up costing them their round. What's my advice? Well, try to actually learn the concepts and understand them deeper than, well, that's just what Grokking used. While you can brute force your way through the coding rounds via hours and hours of leak code grinding, you really can't fake it until you make it with system design. Trying to substitute real world hands-on experience with reading a few articles or books just isn't going to cut it. Those resources are best for people who have prior experience but just lack visibility into the structure and format of a system design interview. People with real experience can draw on this experience and knowledge and actually talk about things in a convincing way. The rest are just hoping that we don't notice. In a similar vein to the first point, another trap that candidates fall into during their system design rounds is that they keep name dropping technologies. And usually the worst part is that they can't explain why X technology was said. I can't tell you the number of times candidates simply say, 
I'm going to use DynamoDB here. And after a simple follow-up of, well, why is that? They just completely fall apart. Well, I know why they said DynamoDB, because that's what Grokking probably said they'd use. This happens time and time again. Candidates read one thing in Grokking or Alex Hughes Primer and immediately take it as gospel truth. Smarter candidates will at least take the time to learn what the alternatives are and the pros and cons of using DynamoDB, for example. So at least they can back up their claim, even if it is just copied. But most will just start to panic, start saying, um, 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 actually, well, maybe DynamoDB isn't actually, um, you know, the, the best uh, choice here. Well, why did you say it then? Well, because you're just repeating a memorized solution, that's why. The amount of candidates who do this, or whenever, for example, a queue is needed, they just throw out a name like Kafka with absolutely no backing up their claims is just beyond counting. Are there times where a particular technology is the best choice? Absolutely. But in most cases, candidates are just name dropping technologies here and there with no idea what they do, how they work, or why it's even a good use case. Again, it's just cargo culting all over again. And one follow-up question, we can detect this and find out who's actually knowledgeable and who's just talking out of their backside. When in doubt, just don't name drop. Don't throw out particular technologies. Keep it a bit vague. Yes, we can use a message queue here. No need to mention Kafka by name or any of the other providers. Just mention the technology you need at a high level, keep it generic. If the interviewer wants to know more, then you can discuss which one in particular detail. But don't throw out a technology just to find out that the interviewer is a 10 year old veteran in let's say Kafka, and now they're gonna grill you harder than a hot dog on 4th of July weekend. Unlike leet code questions where there really are maybe one to two right answers to each question, with system design, there are many directions which you can go in. There's not really one right answer to the problem and most things boil down to the mantra of, it depends. What ends up costing many candidates, especially those at the more senior levels, is their inability to discuss the trade-offs in their approach and design decisions. As with all real world projects, there is rarely one clearly defined solution. The fact of the matter is that there's always more than one way to implement something and each of these options has its own set of pros and cons. For E4 candidates, it's generally okay to need some prompting to discuss these trade-offs, but for more senior candidates, it's a serious miss if you can't do this without constantly being prompted. At E5+, especially at Meta, you are expected to be able to come up with multiple approaches to a given problem and then be able to clearly communicate the trade-offs before making a decision. A lot of this, again, comes back down to a cargo culting mentality when the only justification for a technical decision some people have is that, well, that's what someone else used. If you want to be successful in your system design interviews, especially for senior candidates, then you need to be able to proactively give the trade-offs for big decisions in your system. Otherwise, expect pushback from the interviewer in order to understand your thinking and potentially losing points for constantly needing to be reminded to do this. In a similar light to the trade-off section, another common issue that candidates will do is that they just don't deep dive into interesting parts of the system. What I mean by this is that in each question, there are going to be certain technical aspects which are the crux of that particular problem and the most important topics of discussion. For more senior candidates, it's especially important to be able to properly deep dive into these areas as this is where you can really let your technical knowledge and experience shine through. If you're an E6 candidate and you're wasting time defining all of the little details like what should the creation timestamp field be on the user model instead of talking about the trade-offs between a, let's say push or pull fetch model in a newsfeed API, then you're just wasting time. The more senior you are, the more you're expected to focus on the hard parts of a solution and discuss them. In the same way that your tech lead probably isn't wasting time fixing minor code formatting issues in your team's code base, an E6 candidate here shouldn't be focusing on the minute details which are not that important in the grand scheme of things. Regardless of your level, make sure you're ready and prepared to deep dive into the important parts of the problem and be able to discuss them in greater detail when necessary. More senior candidates will need to proactively identify these areas on their own and without prompting lead the discussion there. For E4, it's generally okay for the interviewer to manually steer you in that particular direction. But regardless, you do need to be able to go into depth on particular topics and a failure to do so can ding you. The next on the list is talking about bottlenecks and potential issues. This one is more applicable to senior candidates, but it's still worth mentioning. Similar to how we expect candidates to be able to understand and vocalize trade-offs in the design, 
We also expect seniors to be able to identify and call out potential bottlenecks and issues with their design. Even if we make an informed decision about our decision choices after weighing the pros and cons, then there are still downstream effects of what we chose. The more senior you are, the more of the expectation to be able to proactively identify and discuss these, and even stronger candidates will be able to spot these issues beforehand and make the appropriate provisions for them. This is one of those things that just comes with experience and really cannot be learned from reading an interview guide. Usually this knowledge is the result of first-hand experience and most likely getting burned by making wrong, the wrong decision. That's the magic of system design interviews. You can only really fake it until you make it at the E4 level. After that, everything starts to come apart and the cream rises to the top, as they say. Now, this last one really only applies to product architecture interviews, but I'll mention it here at the end for the sake of completeness. With product architecture interviews at Meta, the focus is away from building a scalable and fault tolerant system to designing a product with an end user in mind. Instead of worrying about how to, for example, properly shard and replicate your data, our focus is instead on building a product and the ultimate user experience. What ends up costing a lot of people in these interviews is completely forgetting about the user in the context of their design. Remember that your decisions should be made such that they balance the overall design of the system with the experience of the end user. You can have the most efficiently designed system with the slickest DB schema and the best caching mechanism. If the experience for the end user sucks, then they're not gonna use the product. For these interviews, it's important to tie back all important decisions in your design back to the end user and what would give them the best experience. Of course, we can't just tailor everything to the end user as there's trade-offs which need to be made balancing the user experience and the ability to actually build the system and perform the stated task. A lot of people forget about this aspect of the design and treat the interview like a standard system design, but with a little bit of extra focus on the APIs. In reality, we need to be making informed decisions about how our choices will affect the end user. This interview is really best suited for those who are working as full stack engineers, as they have the experience of building both backend and frontend. I frequently encounter people with only backend experience trying to do these interviews, and it's really clear that they have no idea or any hands-on experience of building usable APIs or how to think in the context of a customer and tailor things to their downstream needs. So when preparing for these interviews, make sure if you're doing product architecture to always have the end user in the back of your mind and make informed decisions regarding their experience and how your design decisions will affect that. So that's my list of the top areas which end up costing candidates in their system design interviews. I think the system design interview is a beautiful thing. It's so open-ended that it means that there really is no right answer. Thus, it's really easy to spot the candidates who try and use the same approach over and over because it's exactly what the online resources use for their design. It's so easy to quickly determine who has just memorized an approach and is regurgitating that information versus who actually has experience. We do these interviews sometimes multiple times per week. We know exactly how to make that distinction. While you can sort of get away with this at an E4 level, above that, the expectations and the bar is way too high to for this fake it until you make it. So my advice for people struggling with preparing for this interview is this. Yes, by all means, use all of the available resources online to get a basic understanding of the interview structure and some of the common solution patterns. But don't think that that means memorizing them and being able to recite them convincingly is some sort of replacement for actual knowledge. No blog, no video, or no online course will ever replace real world hands-on experience. There's just some things you can't learn online and you have to go through the fire yourself. So if you're going to lean heavily on these resources, then you'd better understand the reasoning behind all of their decisions and not just cargo cult them out of ignorance. The same way you can just memorize a leak code solution, you can do the same with system design answers. But don't be surprised when a few carefully pointed follow-up questions can collapse your entire house of cards. We know what we're doing and we will catch you out if we have our suspicions. So prepare well and make sure you can back up what you say. With all that being said, that's where I wanna leave this video. If you enjoyed this or found it useful, then leave a like and a comment for the YouTube algorithm, subscribe for more videos like this, and as always, I will see you in the next video.